Good morning to all of you who have joined us, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, it's morning, midday, one o'clock in, in, the, in uh, the UK. So good afternoon to those who are joining us from the UK. Uh, thank you very much for being present. I am Sharon Constanson. I'm CEO of Genius Boards and Genius Methods. We are a consulting company in the board evaluation, board development, board training space. Let me introduce my guest. Uh, Rona is, I love her description of herself. She calls herself Chief Change and Planet Officer, which is who she is to her customers. To herself, she is Chief Executive of iRegen, which is an organization and a person that is absolutely passionate about the sustainability of business, sustainability of our planet, about the ESG elements, about our environment, about climate change. So there are many, many areas that Rona is very, very passionate about. You'll soon see and share the passion with her as well of the things that are important to her. And I think what we want to get across to you today uh, in this webinar is to make sure that you understand as a board, you actually can make a difference. It's not difficult to make a difference. We all have to take responsibility to ensure we are making a difference. One, because our customers expect it, our staff expect it, our investors expect it. All our stakeholders are expecting us to consider long-term sustainability. Not only is it good governance, it's actually good business. To start with Rhoda, it might be helpful if you could introduce yourself. Just tell us a little bit about your journey because it's been really, really fascinating hearing who you are today, but why, where have you come from? Why is this your passion today? Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Sharon. And thank you for the introduction um, and, and having me here today. Um, so a virtual hello to everybody on um, the, the, the webinar today. As Sharon mentioned, my name's Rona. Um, I live and work in the UK and I actually started my career way back when um, with uh, big brands like Red Bull. Um, I worked in FMCG companies, fast moving consumer good companies. And I worked my way up um, to sort of board level. So I've, I've sat where you're sat essentially as a entertainment and sports director within the NEC group. And it was during that time and over those sort of 15 to 20 years of work that I realized through traveling, through doing philanthropic work, that there was a lot more going on. And, and having come from a brand like Red Bull, where we were risk takers and culture was really important and understanding your stakeholders was at the heart of everything we did. I guess in a way, I just assumed everyone was like that. Um, fast forward sort of 15 years and having worked in commercial marketing, innovation, supply chain, um, I'd really started to get a really good understanding of the bigger picture of business but burning all the way along through every trip with the family or scratching the surface of what was going on around me, it soon became very apparent um, that the way we are transitioning as a world, both through the fourth industrial revolution, but also through sustainability, that for me, it was a no brainer. Once I knew the facts, then essentially I kind of had to reinvent, if you like, and, and kind of study in this area. So Yes, I've been working in this space for about seven years now, um, studied at Cambridge. I've read oh, far too many books. Um, but in terms of me today, I'm a Prince's Trust mentor. I'm also on the board of trustees for Education Africa. My day job, if you like, is essentially advising, educating and empowering people um, from SMEs to corporations on these very topics. Um, I've got a couple of really wonderful global initiatives, a water initiative in India, a um, jungle restoration project in Panama and a natural fertilizer project in America. So alongside doing workshops um, in this space, um, I love doing these sessions because it allows that interaction and myth busting and, and kind of giving you that the, the knowledge and the facts to really hopefully empower you to act at the end of it. So thank you, Sharon, for having me. 
Inspiring as always. Thank you so much. Um, the part that you talk about, you make the globe sound like it's a little place like this. You're doing something over there. It's something over there. The globe's a big place. So it's fascinating that the fact that you have interests in such different environments, such different places. Mm. So um, not talking about those specifically at the moment, let's just get to the boards of UK companies. What is important for them to consider? Um, we talk, I mean, I'm talking about doing a board evaluation. One of the things I talk about quite often is, is the board fit for the future? Is that board positioned, structured, composition, people, uh, leadership, culture, all those different aspects that we assess at the time of a board evaluation? Is that organization ready for the change that's coming? Because we all know that as fast as we are trying to keep, to keep up, our board environment is actually running faster than we are. And I think a lot of organizations don't realize that. And we sit around on boards for nine years. How can you be fit for the future if you've been there nine years? You know, so mm -hmm. it's, how do we refresh, regenerate our boards over and above having high churn and therefore high learning. Yeah, so there's a balance between both of those we know about. But what for you in your space makes mm. board future fit? No, absolutely. And a great question and a great, a great tension. I think I look at the longevity of someone often as a bit like a pop artist. If you can continuously learn and reinvent and move with the times, then I think there's no problem if you've been there nine nine years. I think it's just whether you're still doing. I I, I did a recent post recently about um you know how women were um, to, told and taught home economics, and honestly, I nearly fell off my chair when I looked at kind of that that standards. But essentially, a lot of boards are still working in very traditional economic models and patterns, etc. So longevity is not always a bad thing for me. I think it, it breeds. Uh, consistency it can also show a real uh, good bond with its stakeholders around trust because I think trust is absolutely essential however I think a fit you know a fit for future a fit for purpose board essentially nowadays has to be able to not only recognize that the board has to move in terms of diversity and inclusion or recognize that they're going to set carbon net zero targets the challenge I think that boards have got today is that very, very few, though they recognize the accountability um, for sustainability, for example, there's only about 2% of boards who actually have the correct literacy or expertise in that, in that area. And that's not through necessary negligence or we're not bothered, but it's actually such a huge topic. So we've shifted from global warming to climate change, the way I like to talk about it and empower people is more around systems change and sustainability. And I'd love everybody in this call to recognize that there are 17 sustainable development goals. And within that, just under 300 objectives of where you can act and influence. Now, I appreciate that might even still seem very, very overwhelming, but the fact that we're not encouraging boards and we're not giving them the literacy and the training that's required. We're then relying on maybe misinformation or lack of knowledge. And that's therefore when mistakes happen, um, either willingly or not, you know, not knowingly. But that board for the future, there are plenty of reports um, through McKinsey that can show how a business can be 36% more profitable with a very, very diverse board. Um, and so for me, when I look at the stats also in, in investing as well, uh, the relationship between only, what is it? 1.5% of all investing goes to women, for example, but their success rate is far greater. So I think, although we've talked a good talk, about um, boards and diversity. Sadly, we've we've um, we've acted very very slowly. So I think that essentially closing that gender, racial, and kind of um, 
generational gaps is something that really is a no-brainer now you know it is kind of whether that's a silent board and you bring on a, a young youth team um whether that's um taking um somebody who essentially is who's going to challenge you as well as you challenge them and i think not being afraid afraid of that we as we as humans are scared of change um we like to stay with the status quo we can be quite rigid and you know, if it's worked before and we're still making profit and i think my team are still happy uh, the customers are still buying then it is very easy to kind of keep going along whilst not seeing what's coming at an exponential rate at us and i think sorry i'm, I'm sure you've got a ton of questions so i think recognizing who all our stakeholders are not just those that essentially we pay dividends to um driving trust in that area and increasing li uh, literacy across technological advances and sustainability is going to be critical a lot to take in there already at least of all the rest of the hour we have still got uh, ahead of us the you were talking about a board being fit for the future and we had you gave quite a, a lot of context around the um, aspect of diversity. Hmm. Just an observation that I make, we talk about DE and I, and one of the things that I get uh, passionate, not quite as passionate as you do about yours, but I get passionate a little bit about my stuff as well, <laughs> is I actually think sometimes we look at some of these um aspects of um, doing the right thing in slightly the wrong lens. So if you look at, for example, DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion, my view is we should start with the I. If we do not have a mindset through our leadership, through the culture of our organization, through the people we've brought in so far, if we do not have a mindset of being mindfully inclusive, mm -hmm. any aspect of newness is going to be a change too far and we're going to reject the diversity we're bringing in and we won't listen to it, we won't absorb it. So my feeling is we should be looking from the leadership perspective, which is the question I'm going to get to in a moment, is it's critical to, to have this open mindset. We can then have policies, procedures, processes mm -hmm. that we can bring into the organization that follows on from the culture we've already started with of being then equitable towards our different diversities that we are bringing in. And there are so many of yeah. them. I, I, I talk for hours to my students on diversity alone, at least for all the rest of the topics we're going to cover. And with that, both the mindset and the governance that we've brought in through policy, mm. we now can actually look at what diversities are applicable to this organization. And not every diversity, in my view, is appropriate. So you could mm. imagine having um, a menagerie of animals or a pack of dogs. All the dogs are different from a chihuahua to a great dame, but they are dogs. The others, birds fly off, snakes bury themselves, uh, sharks are in the sea. Yeah, the diversity is so great that there's no degree of leadership that's going to bring value out of that. So we always talk about diversity. And for me, it's critical that the diversity is aligned to culture, to goals, to industries, to customers, to all our stakeholders. Mm. So I think people get sort of carried away about the fear you were talking about it's so big diversity yeah. in itself is equally such a huge thing uh, that if we break it down to what diversity is meaningful i think leaders would probably absorb it a little bit easier um, especially if we've got the governance we've got the process it becomes easier for the board rather than to sort of start with a blank sheet of paper mm -hmm. so to my question sorry that was a little bit of a long intro um, <laughs> to my point around leadership we have leadership at two levels on the subject of sustainability and doing the right thing in the aspects yeah. of climate change carbon uh, diversity we obviously have an internal champion we have a board 
and mm-hmm. we have a chair chairman of the board. Where do you see those responsibilities sitting yeah. typically? And where should they be if it's different? Yeah, brilliant. Um, great question. I do just want to touch on a couple of things that you said there. So I think we're Please. talking about the, the nature nurture element and us as individuals, uh, we have this you know unconscious bias around the world we grew up in, the circles that we that we share. And I think until we uh, allow ourselves to, I in my space, for example, I like to listen and read to people who oppose some of my beliefs and thoughts in sustainability. You might call them climate deniers, you might call them you know, lobbyists, whatever. But I believe in opening my eyes and ears to those conversations, but also, the very nature that in sustainability, we talk about biodiversity. Now, people can understand that the interconnectedness of biodiversity makes it all work and it's all in balance. And the moment you break one of those tipping points, like the moment we stopped having wolves in Canada or the the moment we stopped, if we didn't have whales in the ocean, it, it is a tipping point that hits every single species and, and we as humans are, I guess, the only ones that are trying to live outside of this interconnectedness. So um, I think, yeah, just, I mean, just touching on those points, I think being brave to, to take yourself out of your shell of what you think you know um, can really be empowering. And actually diversity is the same as biodiversity. We all need each other to be interconnected. And that's when the magic happens. So you touched on culture now and, and also the role of sustainability. Now, in a recent study, about 69 percent of everybody who has a sustainable um, role or a, um, a title within businesses have come from within, have been internally trained. Um, and so there is a mass shortage out there because that's not really necessarily been coming through from education. I'm pleased to say I'm seeing it now in a GCSE level. I've got two daughters. One is at that level. So we're seeing those topics. There's a new section now in geography that talks about environmental risks. Um, so it's coming. But between now and then we have this this big gap. And I think that's been led due to a lot of denial and lobbying over the last sort of five decades so recognize that if you are going to upskill um, a- an individual within your business, they need to look and think bigger than just your business and your sector. OK, so that would be my first piece of advice. My second would be that as a board, you are accountable to deliver that. So I don't personally believe that it's down to just one, you know, chief heart officer or head of sustainability (laughs) this is about how are you setting your kpis within the business to reflect a modern day organization so what initiatives have you got and and who who is responsible for those initiatives is the board um bonused against sustainable initiatives is the entire workforce got a kpi within innovation and uh, technology or within sustainability. So until that becomes part of your company's DNA, you're always going to be talking one thing, but not acting out in real life. Which you absolutely right about, because you see it so often, what we measure is achieved. And however much many of us don't like quotas, we don't like KPIs, but we do know that they do create action. What we've always got to watch out for, this is one thing, maybe just a quick question in this. Mm. Quite often we will have a KPI in finance when a business, and I've seen this a few times, we need to up the uh, net profit ratio from let's say 10% to 12% argument sake. So what do they do? They cut costs. Ah, good. We've got our 10% has gone to 12%. But we've cut costs invariably marketing. We've cut staff. We've cut investment, uh, regeneration in technology. We've cut things that are ultimately going to trip the company up and it's going to fall over. So we have not achieved the right outcome. So our outcome is wrong. The KPI 
therefore is creating unintended behavior and unintended outcomes. How do we set KPIs in this yeah. really complex area that we actually get the right behavior? Yeah, great question. And I think the key word there, and, and, it, and it's not, you know, no pun intended, is sustainability. So having been in the corporate world, I know very often, and I've lived on that, you put in your, you know, the, the kind of board say, right, what are, what are your targets for this year? What are you going to achieve? You put in your target and it comes back with plus another 10% on and you're like, hold on a minute, <laughs> where did that come from? <laughs> um, but the very notion of it being sustainable. So yeah, we can cut out technology. We can cut out training. You, you always find that the HR division yep. will suffer. Um and we can cut out headcounts and we can keep restructuring. But at some point, you will hit a breaking point or a tipping point. Normally, it's on your people, essentially. Um, so sustainable only really describes, uh, focuses on something that just because you're doing it doesn't mean to say that it is sustainable by its own nature. Yeah. You can't keep doing it. And if what you're doing is wrong, then it's sustainably wrong. <laughs> You're just going to keep doing the same thing. So that's why people are moving now and talking about, um, you know, purpose, profit, people, planet. And yes, we none of us working in this space are expecting companies to work breaking even every, you know, every year. We we need to talk about um, profitable it's not sustainable businesses. If they did exactly exactly so there has um, to be a generation of reserves so that the company is sustainable in difficult times so if we don't have a profit problem with profit it's that balance of profit for what yeah and i think that's a really great point because actually at the root cause of all of this that we talk about is of course um our 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 vision and our um, longevity. So often we're looking at maybe a couple of years, we're thinking about monthly targets, my end of year bonus, actually I wanna retire in three years or I'm gonna hand this business over. But it's about questioning, well, what's what's the legacy of handover going to be in five, 10, you know, 100 years time? And how are, how are my stakeholders, current ones and future ones going to have judged my performance? Now, of course, we, we have been beaten up for the last pretty much two decades between financial crashes, between, you know, Brexit, between, you know, a pandemic. It has felt utterly relentless. And now, now we've got this fourth industrial revolution threatening automation and, 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 and jobs. Some boards might think, yes, that's more cost cutting and more <laughs> money saving. Um, and on top of that, we've got this huge and growing demand around, well, you've got to be more sustainable. Um, you've got to think about your impact on nature from doing business. Sadly, we've taken so long over this that now it's just going to be legislated. So there is going to be reporting emissions, there's going to be carbon tax, plastic tax, um, waste analysis. Um, there's a new legislation coming in from the EU around greenwashing. Yeah, all of this stuff is coming because essentially we've been too slow either kind of brushing it under the carpet, um, not really understanding it, um, and just focusing on one thing and that being carbon. And that's probably the biggest mistake you can make um, from the outset. That is a big mistake because that is one that, um, from if you listen to the, the content that came out of, I think it was particularly COP26, COP27, uh, that sort of era, it was all about carbon, carbon, carbon. It's not about a sustainable planet. There was a comment I heard by an expert in your field, um, and he was talking about, and he's more about planet. So his focus right. is planet. So it's a bit different. It's not quite where you are, and he's not so much in with boards. He's more as, as how to help businesses understand their impact on the planet. Yeah, and his view is if the planet were a human and a patient, they wouldn't only be in hospital, they'd be in ICU on a ventilator. Yeah. Now, if you'd said that five years ago, we said, okay, fine. Having no concept what a ventilator actually meant. Pandemic has taught us what how serious it is. If somebody's on a ventilator, that is now 
mission mission critical and, yeah. and many people in the um the planetary space the um climate change are saying that the planet is beyond the tipping point now you made a comment that totally contrasts that um last week where you said mother earth will look after herself please help yeah. me understand those two dichotomies no, absolutely. Listen, there is probably there's a there's around nine major tipping points that we, that we measure. So carbon is one of them, but carbon and greenhouse gas emissions will include, of course, methane, which is eighty times more potent. Um, so uh, I think I joked last week's session. You know, the the UK government want to give tablets to cows to stop them burping, <laughs> um, versus let's carry on and and still grant new fossil fuel. Um, contracts and, and, and oil and gas, which is completely contradictory to their carbon net zero. But other tipping points are things, uh, for example, like biodiversity loss, the use of chemical fertilizers globally, which as we know, goes into the soil, you know, essentially kills the soil and then runs off into waterways and oceans. So it has a huge impact um, on, on the planet. So the when when I talk about that is, the biggest challenge here is really the futures of humanity because we talk about the sixth mass extinction. And I have to be careful when I'm talking about things like this because this is when people start to go, oh God, she's going off on one. We're all gonna die or burn or starve or drown. You know, it gets all a little bit, whoa, you've, you've gone too far, Rona. But the reality is as a trajectory, between the fourth industrial revolution and, and how that's going to change our lives and what we do and what we don't do in the working environment, as well as continuing to consume, I think that's the key word, consume the planet's resources. It cannot physically renew those resources quicker than we are taking them. So at some point we'll get to a moment where you've got lots of people essentially not working you're going to have lots of people migrating because the global south is suffering um potentially civil unrest so you you are going to end up with a mass extinction of humans um but what i'm really confident of is that mother nature is really amazing at regenerating evolving using its secret weapons you know from mushrooms and fungi and the way trees talk to each other in the soils um that if humans weren't here on the planet, she will be fine. She yeah. absolutely will be fine. We've got to start behaving. So getting back to the boardroom. Yeah. That's actually where we are. <laughs> I think everyone's hey. just dialed out now. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's dialed out. We'll get them all back again. Um, just chatting about the boardroom. Mm. I'm sitting there as an on exec and I'm saying, oh my goodness, I feel terrified. I'm out of my comfort zone. Mm. I know we're living in a VUCA, very volatile and ambiguous space, and I don't really know what's going on. There's so much uncertainty. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, and now there's this other thing I've got to learn about. And not talking about IT or the Industrial Re Revolution yeah. yet. Let's just talk purely about our sustainability at a more climate level, the things that we've got to do right. Um, what are the kind of questions I, as a director, should be considering to ask of the exec or ask yeah. of ourselves as a board so that we think differently? Absolutely brilliant question. And I, I guess what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll share my top 10 with you and you maybe you can, can share it out, but I'll pick a couple of them out. But essentially it's, you know, what is your organization's kind of sustainability mission and goals? So you will have as a business, or I hope you will have a mission, vision and values. Um, and I would hope and trust that the, the culture of the business follows that that ethos. Um, so first of all, ask yourself, how how do we act and behave? And, and how do we take the 17 UN sustainability development goals? By the way, you can't do them all. No one expects you to do them all. But you should be able to, to, to pick out three, four, five of those objectives that really marry with what you are doing as a business. 
Secondly, you need to start looking at what steps have you put into place about reducing your carbon footprint. So even at a basic literacy level, we understand there are scopes one, two and three of carbon emissions. And I do understand that there's a lot of carbon tunnel vision, but it is common uh, knowledge and terminology now. So I get I get why people are rolling with this. So what have you done um, to either understand what your emissions are? How are you tracking them? How are you measuring them? Um, and I guarantee you scopes one and two are really pretty simple to get. Scope three are really hard because it's your entire supply chain. Anyone who supports you or is an external business essentially measuring your percentage of those um, uh, carbon emissions through that supply chain. So, you know, I'm not going to lead you out in a false sense of security. That is a hard, hard area to get right. Um, I guess another question would be around how do you talk about it or promote it within internally and externally with your stakeholders are you knowingly greenwashing are you um encouraging your teams essentially to come to ideas with you because i guarantee you your teams working in their different divisions whether you are a product or a service will have thought of ideas that will benefit the business whether that's as simple as reduction of waste or reduction in inefficiencies the good news is, guess what? That saves you money anyway. So don't look necessarily at, if I was to implement sustainability, it's going to be a cost on my p &L. Yes, there are going to be costs on your p &L, but I would also challenge you back, what's going to be the mid-term cost to your business if you don't address these areas? So you talked about um, the kinds of questions one might be asking mm. um, as a director. So the first question that came to my mind is 17 uh, sustainable goals. If I had to choose three out of those 17 that are most likely to be applicable to our audience, what mm. might those be? Honestly, I... I because we're talking to boards of varying different industries and yeah. sectors. So take it, for example, if you are a board of directors for a water company. Right. Um, I genuinely I don't know who's on the call. So I'm, I really am just making making this Examples up. will be hugely helpful to us. No, no, that's fine. So if you're on the board of directors for a water company, I would envisage that at least you would grab one that, that looks at life in the water. Mm -hmm. Because essentially your mission, vision and values is around, I'm assuming, delivering maybe bottled water. It may be um, uh, common goods um, and services. Um, and so that would be a no brainer. You'd also be looking at, at the sustainable development goal that looks at consumption and also looks at wastage. So how are you as a board delivering on wastage? Only 7% of boards across the UK are actually measuring and reporting water usage and wastage. So it's really, it really is at a very simple stage. Just look at the titles. Most of them are no more than three or four words and go, actually, how do, how do me being here every day impact life on land, life underwater, inequalities, education, consumption, technology i could go on go on and on and on but that really is your your starting point at the next board meeting print them off have them up on the board and say right actually do we factor any of these in you gave us a whole number of examples there which is extremely useful we've talked about the diversity aspect and mm. we've covered that in quite a bit of detail but things like wastage I would sense that is a pretty easy one for every single one of us to consider what we waste, food, packaging, all sorts of things, recycling, you know, and, and making that part of our DNA, which it wasn't 20 years ago, which is now. Uh, so we are all doing our little bit, and we can probably all do that little bit more. So, sorry, you... No, 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 I'm just okay. agreeing with you. <laughs> so I if think, we look, I think just 
just to be fair, though, just touching on that, I think this is where you can really get your stakeholders involved. So find out what it is that they're worried about. Find out what it is. You might have a couple of really key players in your organization, employees that are really passionate about this and actually want to see change. Bring them in as a non-exec. Bring them in to advise you. Take more advice, I guess. It, exactly. You know, go and speak to some ki- your grandkids or your nieces and nephews. Find out what's really bothering them, and then think, well, okay, how how can I turn that into an opportunity for me? How can waste reduction impact my PL positively? Um, and I think as if you can lead by example. So what you do in the office, how you do it at home or some of the things that you might do with your family. You know, I talk about being a a planetary citizen as well as a corporate citizen. Those are the things that you could align on with all of your stakeholders and and say, these are the four or five things that we are going to become famous for. We're going to make a few mistakes, I'm sure, along the way, but there will be educated mistakes. Um, so I really like the idea of that is, is kind of becoming a corporate citizen, putting your hat to something and just going for it. I think you you talked at the beginning saying one of the tipping points for businesses, um, if they're getting their sustainable um, project as a cost cutting project rather than as a sustainability project is the place it tends to hurt most is around people. One yeah. of the things that a lot of organizations i understand from what i read because i like to read as you do of of picking up that some people will only work for an organization that has certain sets of values or certain objectives or certain um ways of reporting or engaging their customer all these sort of things that we've been talking about now and if we don't get the right talent in organizations, we might as well stop straight away, hadn't we? Yeah, I think it's a really important point. And often people say to me, but why should I do it? It could be expensive. And I said, well, it's not just the financial institution. So your investors and your bankers who are now expecting you. And that was done deliberately, I think, because let's be honest, start with the money. <laughs> if that drives legislation and questions, then the rest will follow. So um absolutely the next generation and employers are looking for a place that they can be proud to work for and kind of it it becomes part of their character and culture a bit like you know years ago when I was at Red Bull I was so proud to work for that brand I absolutely loved it and I think looking at and not only that you know even me now in this space I've turned down work where I've been openly asked essentially to to kind of help greenwashing or to you know um work for companies that just are are saying something on the outside but actually after a couple of days of scratching they're not and you know my husband's like what are you doing that's money but I can't (laughs) I'm not going to do it I'm not going to do it there will always be people that will But the reality is now, if you don't start doing it, there is somebody out there who will scratch the surface. There are now lawyers not willing to fight for gas and oil companies, not willing to take people like myself who might have protested at the big one on Friday um, or silently protested somewhere. You know, that that movement is changing. So I think um, you you've got to be able to embrace this, but embrace it for the positive opportunities that it can bring and be proud that I guess I always say if anything that you are doing around the sustainable development goals could be perceived as unkind unjust um dangerous um then I'll happily stop what I'm doing tomorrow but I've scratched the surface of all of those goals and the objectives and there's nothing there it's a bit like working for a charity you're not going to turn around and say well, I'm not going to help children in Africa, uh, you know, get a fair education. So I think that's the thing to remember at the heart of this. It is about people and planet and sustainable profit. And sustainable profit is important. Let's change tack slightly. Um, I wanted to talk about technology. In the boardroom, we have non-executive directors who when the IT subject comes up, they zone out. Okay. We're talking about hardware, software, people, uh, new challenges, the um, 
the transformation cultures and transformation projects. I went into one company, it was so funny. They were talking about this massive transformation project that they had. A little bit of scratching the surface in a mm. board evaluation. And they were merging two very manual systems to one manual system rather than two. Game and changer. they called this, this is their transformation project. So I went to the chairman and I said, if that's transformation, what are you going to call it when it is transformation? He said, what do you mean? Hadn't actually scratched the surface to understand what this transformation technology thing they were doing. It was the simplest little thing. It was like putting two Excel spreadsheets together. I am erring as far away sure. on the other side as he was on that side. But to get the point across, it wasn't transformation at any point in time. It was a tactical step of taking a, an action that mm. was going to be a step, yes, but a very, very early step in something quite major. But now if you look, five years have gone through, a pandemic has gone by. Transformation and technology are two words you can put together, but just add 100 kilometers an hour, two or 100 miles an hour, should I say, add a huge degree of speed to it, which immediately brings the average non-executive director into a greater position of fear than they yes. were already. They were fearful because IT and chief information officers and these intelligent people pull the wall over their eyes. So yeah. how would you help a board at this? First of all, let's explain what AI is, what some of the technology yeah. um, trains that are coming towards us are the light, not the, it's not the end of the tunnel, it's the train actually coming towards. Let's talk about that generally and then we can get into some more specifics. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess, as part of my kind of pop star continuous kind of reinventing myself, but trying to go with the times, not only do I, am I driven that because I've got children, but also I'm driven by, you know, the noise around crypto and blockchain and all the, the, the bad bits and what is blockchain and the fourth industrial revolution. And so again, inquisitively you, you go off. So I think the fourth industrial revolution really is a, a, um, a signal that, that our last industrial revolution was obviously and quite nicely tied into how we kind of ruined things in the last 150 years from a planetary perspective. And now we're closing that revolution down and we're moving in to this um, technological revolution. So whereas before we were taking things for, to, into mass production, um, but still using uh, people essentially and uh, heavy uh, machinery and goods, we're now moving into this technological um, world that actually has pretty much blown my mind as well when you look at some of the positive elements and we can touch on these things like how it's going to enable um, driving greater efficiencies reduction of waste smart contracts in procurement how we can track um, and measure and monitor our products and services for circularity um, and how we can use this proactively within our supply chains and I'm sure we'll touch on that but then equally looking and, and having our eyes wide open around um, what are the what are the biases around the data that it's feeding from? And, you know, there was a report in America that said up to 47 percent of, of jobs in America could be at risk through AI and automation. So let's strip this back. You've got blockchain and essentially that is exactly what it says on the tin it's small blocks of information that we just keep piling on top of each other so Lovely. for example <laughs> yeah for example the way i'm using it at the moment for my jungle restoration project is that if somebody comes in and they they pay their 10 pounds for their three by three meter square in that jungle that is recorded in the blockchain no one can ever dispute that ledger. It is, it's used from the what three words, um, you can um, Google Earth it, that's there. And, and that says that Sharon owns that square. She bought it on this date and that is irrefutable. No one can ever come in and change that. So that's how blockchain is gonna help me with credibility and transparency in what I'm doing. So you'll start to see here now that 
this is how it can be used for good. Um, but with anything that can be used for good, we've also got to think about people who might use it for the other way. Um, so I, I build that in the blockchain. And every time Sharon comes to, to Panama and plants a few trees, we take a photo that's logged and all of that information just keeps adding into the blockchain. You've then got the Internet of Things. And to make that really, really uh, easy essentially you and I probably remember the phone would ring you and your brother or your sister would fight over who was picking it up um, and then somebody in the household would be screamed at you know such and such is on the phone and then we moved into the internet didn't we got faxes and email and I'm really showing my age now um, and we were able to interconnect um, different parts of our lives through different forms of medium and now I can, if I want to, I can pick up my phone, I can put my heating on, I can set the cooker off, I could, it, you know, that essentially is the internet of things, it's all the things, and that's probably why it's called that, um, because the, there are so many factors within it, driving clean tech, fintech, um, medical tech, you'll often hear a lot of these um, terminologies, um being being thrown around nfts which are non-fungible tokens um now obviously this isn't a, a a kind of fourth industrial revolution webinar per se but what i'm I, what i'm sort of saying to you is go and just google some of those words and what does it mean how does it apply to your business because i absolutely guarantee you your younger employees or your younger family members are using this on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, my daughter, who might play on, on um, Roblox, for example, she will buy an outfit. Essentially, that's an NFT, but she doesn't call it that. It just becomes part of her DNA. She understands it. And this is what, if we don't engage with it, we're going to miss the trick. We're going to miss how we communicate. How do we do our marketing and our commercial strategies? So... Being aware of the terminology would be the first starting point. Being able to have an adult conversation about some of the ethical issues. So what is the data coming in? How could it impact the well-being um, of my team? But more importantly, how are we going to retrain? That's it, yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a famous saying at the minute. It's not AI that will mean you will lose your job. It's someone who knows how to use AI will take your job. So I know after last week's session, there's so many really cool apps out there. You know, the example of the Excel spreadsheets is a classic one. You know, it's amazing what you can cross over now and not only just combine the data, but do a complete presentation off it by asking a few simple questions and it does it all for you. So being honest about if you've got a copywriter, so if you're a copywriter now, right now, you're thinking, does my job become obsolete? Well, actually, no, but how can you use AI to better enhance your role and therefore giving you more time to make better decisions? We all talk in the workforce, don't we, the 70, 20, 10 rule. I don't ever remember getting the 20 or the 10% of time to train or to do innovative things. It was just 100%, 100 miles an hour. And that's what it's designed to do, really. Sorry, I'm sure you've got questions. So, And I think one of the areas that um, a lot of companies will immediately hone in on uh, in terms of where are we going to have the savings, uh, and let's look to financial services, for example, where you've got a, a transaction happens, A transacts with B, it could happen in property, it can happen in all sorts of, things that are transacted and one is given to the other the physical in return for something in return so even if it's barter that degree of reconciliation that occurs in the life when I was younger to a lesser degree now because technology is already helping it as, as it is but that you talked about the tree and that plot of land is one version of the truth now in the, this kind of environment, there is only one version of the truth. So that yeah. whole regime of reconciliation of the bank balance, bank, uh, the bank statement is all history because yeah. it, things are talking to each other. There's one version of the truth. So I think in a lot of your administrative roles, there are going to be changes. But I think as we all need to accept, every single one of us is going to have 
things that we're familiar with that we can do better and yes. differently. And that just having that smartphone in our hand is half the time we're doing it. We don't actually recognize how we are yeah. using some of those things. We talked about AI and everyone's got really excited these days and suddenly from never knowing what the word chat GPT is, suddenly everyone's an expert or terrified. Yeah. Just give us some example around that, just maybe demystify it a bit and maybe talk about some of the other imminent AI things that are likely to touch us all today, tomorrow, the next day. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, just forget what anyone else says, go around and go and have a play around with it. Like literally, that would always be my best advice. Just go and have a play around with it. It's really easy to open an account and and, and kind of do that. I've, I've done that myself. Um talk to the talk to the younger generation seriously they know it they live and breathe it every single day but take for example a um a smart contract um within um the, the blockchain and within ai that can drive huge efficiencies for supply chain departments and procurement because what it enables you to do is without having to go all right okay i've got my 12 month renewals now and then i've got to do in six months i've got to start the negotiation contracts off again and all of that process a lot of that can be um so reduced in terms of time because it automatically just happens for you so whilst that's happening rather than look at it and saying actually then i only need half my supply chain team that's when you're then tasking your supply chain so how do we transition them from goods and services that we are currently using into goods and services that can identify a better purposeful people, planet, sustainable profit. Um, so it's about recognizing the efficiency savings in time, but then how do we then um, do that 2010%? How do we then challenge the supply chain team to think really innovatively? And you talked about it, about transformation. I find that incredible sometimes when we look at what people perceive as transformation and actually it's just a little bit of change. Um, so I think also taking things like fintech, fintech is going to drastically challenge the way we do business financially. So it's going to remove a lot of um, middlemen and women. It is going to challenge what we as business leaders have often hidden or kept behind closed doors. There is going to be more and more demand. So back to my kind of little square, I don't care actually, because I will show that Sharon's paid 10 pounds and nine pounds has gone to the project and we've kept a pound to keep the lights on. There's going to be more and more instances of businesses acting in that way that lots will wait and follow or wait till legislation, but this tech will really change the financial institutions. It will change um, governments and legislation and policy as well, because we'll soon be able to dive into every pound that we, the government spends. Where does that contract go to? Who was that contract supplied by? I mean, COVID I'm sure is some brilliant examples of tremendous waste of, of, of public money. So again, don't be scared by it, but just know how you could use it to your advantage. I think one of the things that we talk about in terms of an effective board is that relationship between executive and non-executive, mm. between the two leaders that are working together with a constructive challenge between them, not directive either way, not disrespectful either way, mm. and both... One leads the board, one leads the organization. They don't clip each other's wings. So you're looking for this, this leadership that goes like this together. And behind the scenes, obviously, the chair is challenging the, the CEO to yeah. think about, have you thought of this, have you thought of that? But in the board meeting environment, the chair now leads the meeting, which is very different yeah. to somebody leading the organization. But one of the things we always demand as non-executive directors, as a board, is transparency. One of the things I see so frequently yeah. is lack of transparency, lack of openness, uh, resistance to the board's inquiries and challenges yeah. and the debate, thinking, get out of my space, this is mine, don't, don't step on my toes, 
don't clip my wings, which I do agree with. Don't clip the CEO's wings because they'll leave anyway. So that's not a good idea. Yeah. So making sure you give them the space to be themselves. So now we've got this aspect where you are saying to us as non-execs that naturally transparency into an organization is changing. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely it is. And I think what I would say to that is I've worked in very, very different organizations from one where culture, trust and being able to challenge my MD or CEO was easy and welcomed and supported. And in fact, that individual knew that when I left and took on a better role in the future, he'd done his job by me. All right. So I grew up in that world. But then moving forward into other corporate structures, there was a fear. You couldn't, you wouldn't dare challenge the head of finance or the head of sustainability or the CEO. So you have to ask yourself as a board, have I made the ability and the culture within the organization to bring new ideas, to be transformative and, and to, you know, I guess the way I look at it, I always love working pe- with people that you sit there and go, God, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> you know, brilliant, <laughs> ingenious idea. And I think that's where the, you know, it's, you've got to ask yourself, am I driving that behavior in the first place? Am I open? Am I welcoming that? Um, and there's different ways of doing that. You can do it openly, ver- verbally, you can do it in forums, you can have little boxes that sat across different departments and people can put anonymous ideas in or anonymous feedback there are different ways to do it um but yes people are expecting more transparency of information the internet of things has essentially allowed us at our fingertips to um, get information now information is often biased depending on who's put it up there and controlled etc um there is, I love being in a boardroom and I love seeing the dynamics of different players. But actually, when you allow yourself to feel a little bit vulnerable and allow someone to come in and challenge you in a really empowering way, when you then feed that out to the rest of the business to get consensus or see what you think, you'll actually start to see that momentum move. And I can't yeah, exactly say it. To this day, that first business that I was in, the way we worked, the the, the cultural aspects, the innovation, the risk taking, all of that, um, is is so powerful. It is so powerful that twenty years later, you know, we are all still comrades and friends around the world, and most of us are entrepreneurs, and a lot of us have got our own businesses. Um, please embrace it. Well, that was a perfect way. I was going to say, is there a final comment you'd like to make? But I think you've just done exactly that. And we are on time. Rona, as was last week, a totally different discussion. Amazingly how in two hours we've actually covered two very, very different grounds of topics, even though our title was fairly similar. Yeah. And I'm sure we could talk for another two hours and still cover new new territory. And I'm sure if we were to look at all the many questions that could come from all our stakeholders in all of our businesses. But the message I take back that I think is the strongest one is talk to the younger generation. I was mm-hmm. in a meeting the other day and one of the, uh, we're in a, like a um, a working group, a cohort of four people together, and our age ages run from my age down to her, which is about 23. Yeah. And she talks like, what is she talking about? Okay, tell me, show me, let me see. Okay, all right, I can, I can see now what this is, but I didn't even know it existed. I didn't know yeah. that that app was available. We've got used to the apps we use because those yeah. are the ones we innovatively, I mean, mine, biggest innovation in my life was Lotus one, two, three. Oh my goodness me, has life moved on? But it's it just gives you an idea of the value of one of our diversities and that is age. Yes. And all, it's so much so today in today's boardroom is bring in that age diversity in some manner. It might not be a non-exec, but you want that intelligence to come to the board. 
No, absolutely. And I, I just want to say a massive thank you for, for having me on today, um, thank you. Sharon. And please embrace what could be seen as quite scary with the fourth industrial revolution and, and sustainability ESG. But please, please embrace it and, and allow people like myself and other experts to come and really empower you to make those changes because it can be done. Thank you. And I appreciate it. Yes, it can. We can all make a difference. Can we break it down? It's actually day to day things in many cases. Yeah. Thanks for your time, Rona, and look forward to speaking again. Absolutely. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Bye.